Thank you. 
welcome to church. It's nice to have to see everyone here. Let's uh, stay in this morning and we'll begin our service with prayer. Lord, we are thankful, God, for the time we have together. And Lord, we do want to uh, show the appreciation uh, we need to you and, and hearing the word of God and help us to worship the way that we ought to. And Lord, you know that there's many sicknesses, uh, those that are in the hospital, uh, those that are maybe just be suffering from flu or COVID and God, you know, each thing that is needed, uh, Lord, but uh, we're here uh, and now help us to worship you in spirit and truth, Lord, that we may grow and grow closer to you and help souls that are here and at home, uh, God, and just uh, help us have a, a good service uh, and, and uh, today in Jesus' name, amen. All right, we'll have a choir. So I have an announcement this morning. We have a very special person in our midst. And uh, this is the um, oldest member in our, con in our congregation. And uh, it is her birthday. So Sister Doris, can you stand up? She's like, are you going to make me do this? <laughs> this is Sister Doris. <laughs> I've, I've known Sister Doris my whole life, and uh, she was, I believe, one of my teachers when I was in very young, and, uh, but a wonderful sister of God and uh, a pillar. We could call her a pillar in the Church of God this morning, but she is 93 years old. Wow. So we're going to sing happy birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, Doris, happy birthday to you. Everything to me, he's everything to me. 
I serve my Lord today, he condescends to me. Through all the changes on my way, still everything to me. He's everything to me. Everything to me. He's everything to me. Yes, everything to me. Yes, he's everything to me. Of all in time of sorrow, my help today, tomorrow, the blessed Christ of God. Breathe.
while the choir is going down, you can stand up. <laughs> if we could all stand, <laughs> ready for some congregational singing. If you, we're going to have it up here. If you can't see it, this is in um, the hymnal, page 89. to him who reigns above in majesty supreme who gave his son for man to die that he might man redeem blessed be the name blessed be the name blessed be the name of the ruined by the fall. Thou hast devised salvation's plan, for thou hast died for all. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be Blessed be the name of the Lord. His name shall be the Counselor, the mighty Prince of Peace. Of all earth's kingdoms conqueror, whose reign shall never cease. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. If you want to stand up, you can stay standing as well. That's up to you. This is uh, number 343 in the hymnal. He leadeth me. <clears throat> he leadeth me, your blessed thought, O words with heavenly comfort fraught. Whate'er I do, where'er I be, Sometimes mid scenes of deepest gloom, sometimes where Eden's powers bloom, by waters calm or troubled sing, still tis his hand that
and he leadeth me. Lord, I would clasp thy hand in mine, nor ever murmur nor repine. Content, whatever lot I sing, since tis my God that leadeth me. We have a couple other songs this morning, so if Sister Glenda will go and have you first, and then we'll have Brother Brett and Sister Trish come up to bring their songs. I was thinking, um, actually this morning, one of the BSD classes, um, that we were thinking back and being giving testimonies of thankfulness as far as how God had uh, helped through a situation this past year. And a lot of times at the beginning of a year, we're looking forward. What, what can we get accomplished? What are those goals, etc.? But this morning, I wanted to be thankful as far as looking back, and not so much thankful in my own sense, but I wanted to thank those in the congregation, because there's a lot of times, you know, we see some people doing work, and there's sometimes we don't see things that are being done, and I know that there's been a lot of work done this, <clears throat> this past year. Um, I mean, you, some of the things you can see, like all the, the projects, preaching, you know, committees that we have, so there was a lot of work done this, this past year, um, you know. Uh, some over in Africa, right? And so there's, there's a lot of work, in, and we don't want to forget to say, to say thank you for those things that you're doing, whether seen or not seen. Uh, because there's a scripture in the Bible that says, what does it say? Be not weary in well-doing, for we shall reap if we faint not, right? And, and thinking along, uh, sorry, and if I can't hear you too well, I've got a ringing in my ear, so I'm having a hard time. Um, but <clears throat> Brother Danny, when he was mentioning the, you know, saying no and having that, that balance, right? It's important that we say no to the things we need to say no to so that we can say yes to that work um, that we want uh, to get done. So there was a lot of work accomplished this last year. So thank you for everyone for that effort you made. And, and for us to work together is important in the kingdom of God because God doesn't, he's not forgetful. I can't remember what I wear yesterday, but God doesn't forget the things that we do, the struggles, even the, some of the things that we struggle with and the things we've done. We may even forget, but God is not forgetful for those that labor of love uh, that you're doing for the work of the kingdom of God. So thank you all for what you've done, and she's just sitting up here just waiting. Just, just sit down. All right, I'm going to let Sister Glenn bring her song. This song you'll recognize. It's Jesus Loves Me, and I was just thinking about um, how sometimes, at least in my life, you know, I haven't always realized how much Jesus loves me. And I, I have noticed, like, for me, if I, if I don't really trust that he loves me, then it's hard to trust him, you know, in my life, you know, and, and what's going on, about what's going on in my life, because struggles and things come. But if I trust that he really loves me and he's seeking the best for me, then it's, you know, there's a, a rest there, knowing that my God loves 
me. You know, he loves me so much he died for me. And he loves me so much that he's with me each day. And he will help me through every situation and trial and things I might not understand and things I might need to work on. But God is there and he loves us so much. And I'm just so thankful for his love. And I hope that you will be blessed and that you will feel his love for you. Thankful to say that my sins are all taken away. <laughs> you guys know this song well. You're welcome to sing along with us. Something to be um, thankful for and reminded of. Uh, we can take it for granted sometimes that we can live for sin free, without sin. I don't want to take that for granted. That is a blessing in serving God. Um, it's something to rejoice about. That's the word I was looking for.
All right, good songs. All right, so we're, before we have uh, the preaching this morning, we will go to prayer. Uh, we want to make sure that prayer is not the, it's not the how many times you go to prayer, right? We want to be a, effective, right? And effective is making the connection with God. And I know we only have a small amount of time here, so it's just more reiterating the importance of, of having personal prayer as well, making sure we have that connection with God um, so that he's hearing, he's really hearing from us versus hearing repetition, right? All right, so is there any special spoken prayer requests that we, uh, we need to make known this morning? If not, oh, Brother Jeff. <coughs> Sister Janice called and uh, said she's not feeling well today. Pray for her. All right. Let's remember the many that are that are sick. That's time of year, but plus we've had some additional um, urgent ones that are in the hospital. So, um, all right. Any unspoken prayer requests? You can raise your hand if you have an unspoken. Let's stand this morning, and we'll ask uh, Brother Leonard. Would you lead us in prayer, please? Dear God, we're thankful to come to you in your presence, Lord. We appreciate each one of the saints, God, and how you led each one to you and the truth of your word, God, and uh, in each of their hearts, God. And my God, it's it's what shows and shines forth the difference in a life that's lived, God. And we appreciate it, God. We love seeing uh, the saints and the being able to be with them and spend that time, God. And we just appreciate each one, and they, each one is precious, Lord, in their test, own testimonies, and we appreciate that, God. And, Lord, we appreciate being able to come here and, uh, and enjoy the uh, truth of your word that feeds our soul, God. And we just pray that you continue to bless the service, and we'll thank you for that. Lord, we also ask, God, for these needs, God, and we think of Sister Janice Martin and uh, the special request that was made there, God. And, we just pray that you'd uh, reach out and touch her, give her that uh, divine touch that she needs, Lord, and others too, God, have that need in their own bodies, Lord, that need that touch, God. We just, we, you know the unspokens that way. We ask that you would touch them and uh, heal them, if you will, God, that we might hear that testimony as well, Lord, and we'll thank you for it, God. We appreciate how, God, that uh, you're so faithful to us to show us whatever needs we might have in our own lives, and God, how um, you uh, show us, God, how you want us to uh, speak to uh, souls out there, God, that don't know you maybe, and maybe some that do and just need uh, to know more about you, God, and so we just pray that you'd continue to bless us that way and use us. Uh, we know that uh, there's many that have uh, talked uh, at request of prayer for different ones that they've come in contact with, that they would like to see these ones uh, have a deeper experience in you, Lord, like they, like we do, like we share, um, Lord. And so we just pray that you'd help us to find these souls, help us to know what to say, God, help us with the very words uh, that would come forth through our lips, God, that would uh, be your words that would touch the hearts of these ones, God, and help them to see the difference in just being uh, a religious individual, Lord. We want uh, more than just religion, God, in our hearts. We want to be that life and that example that uh, souls would get and uh, feel that uh, that that nourishment from you, God, that uh, you want us to experience. And so, uh, Lord, uh, help us to present the, that which you'd have, God, that would deal with these hearts and that we'd see more souls come to you, God. And help us this year to do our part, Lord God, in carrying the proper burden and, and seeking these hearts, God, so that we can see 2024 be an even greater blessing that we've received in 2023, God. We appreciate all the efforts. We, we know they need uh, prayer as well, God. The efforts of the different programs the out, uh, that, that we've that, that the saints have worked together uh, tirelessly to kind of see a, an improvement in our outreach, God. And so we just ask, God, that you'd please uh, honor that, God, and bless each and every uh, effort that way, God, that we might see uh, 2024 uh, blessing even greater than in a greater way, Lord. And we'll thank you for it. And we ask in Christ's name your blessing. Amen.
Amen. All right, we're going to have time for the Word of God. Sister Kim, you have to wait for a microphone, please. Thank you. I just wanted to be thankful. It's been a while since I stood up and gave thanks, and God's been so good to me. This is a beautiful life. I never want to take what God has given me for granted, ever. Sorry. I've been going through, everybody goes through hard times. I've been going through some struggles, and you know, God has met my needs every single step of the way. There's always been someone or something. The saints are beautiful, good people. They're generous. They're kind. They're, they pray for you. You know you can depend on them. Just, you know, I don't ever, I've never been in a place in my life where in the last 27 years where I couldn't call out on God and he wasn't right there to help me every time I needed him. And I love the fact that the Church of God in Carmichael, it is a lighthouse. It is a blessing to those around. They don't see it yet, but they will. Those that have seen it, they stay because there's life here. And I appreciate that. I don't ever want to lose what God has given me. This has been the best 27, almost 28 years of my life, and I'm so thankful for it. All right. <clears throat> Good morning. Glad you came to church this morning. <clears throat> We're still praying for some that are not well, and um, God knows, but we're grateful that we serve a God that hears and answers prayer. Amen? So, <clears throat> I'd like to speak to you this morning, again, on a topic that I, the Lord reminds us as we move into the new year, we're looking forward, as the brother said, we're thankful for what has happened in this past year, but I am encouraged, I... Uh, I'm anxious to see what God will do <clears throat> for us in this coming year. Uh, anxious is a good word because I, uh, in a sense, I don't want to wait. I want to see it now. But that's going to involve labor and work, right? Effort on our part that we would be used so that God could accomplish his purpose. And part of that involves <clears throat> our spirit and the way we're put together, right? How we... Um, how we wake up in the morning, what we came in with, what, how we've lived this week out in our homes and our work and so forth. Uh, God needs a, a vessel that he can use, right? He says, uh, this is a temple that he wants to occupy with his spirit. So where we take it, what we do with it, how we um, display it, how we um, present ourselves to others, all of this matters. I'm reading something uh, at home <clears throat> about a um, story involving a, a religious person and, and one that is seeking God. And in that particular um, way of understanding God and the way this book is written, it's not from a Christian point of view, it's from something else. One of the thoughts is that, you know, people come to church and they hear the preaching and they might listen to singing and so forth, but when they leave, they're not much different than when they came in. And it doesn't mean a whole lot. You know, it's more an association with family or a tradition in the family. Mom and dad go here, so they go here. Grandpa goes here, so they go there. Um, maybe it's a friend that they know, but it's kind of, it's kind of the part of Part of, and this is what we're going to talk about, is part of the fabric of their life, but it's not all that important. Well, that's not the witness that Scripture gives us of a Christian, nor of um, a person who is seeking truth. Now, that might be the witness of sort of popular culture today in terms of how it how it sees religion, that might be that witness, but that's not this witness. And we really, as we look forward into 2024, we can start to take stock. It's kind of a, kind of, kind of a time when you uh, put things together that you did last year. Take stock of where you are. That's, that's the message in here this morning. Um, some of us, we, um, 
at the beginning of the year, we start to think about all the um, things that we accomplished last year. We tidy up books and records, and we uh, start to get ready for the new year and all that. So it is one of those messages this morning, a, ca- a kind of take stock of where we are, and um, <clears throat> is it going to um, allow us to, to help us get where we need to go this year, okay? So that's what we're going to do. My title this morning is, Where Have All the Weavers Gone? Do you understand what I mean when I say weaver? Someone who um, makes cloth. Um, a weaver. Where have all the weavers gone? There was a song that um, was written in the 50s. It was made popular in the 60s. Where have all the flowers gone? Pete Seeger actually wrote it in the 50s. And I, th- I thought, just came into my head, where have all the weavers gone? And I want to talk about weavers this morning and weaving and some thoughts about that and what Scripture tells us about a tightly woven life. That's what I'm thinking about, okay? Where have all, because God wants weavers today, busy weavers, weaving lives and weaving threads into people's lives that, that help them have a tightly woven wi- life, life, not wife, life, um, that, that'll be useful, okay? That'll hold together. When a nation turns its back on God, it tends to unravel. The weave which has been woven in that society, it starts to unravel. And the thread, the fabric that holds that society together, it starts to lose its tension, its effectiveness, and we see that today. We see that in our culture today. We've seen it for a very long time. When society turns its back on God, and presumes that the thread that God adds to the weave is not really all that necessary. And they leave God out of what the fabric of society that's being woven. But it's not just society because we know that society is a collection of people. Any society begins with a person, and that's you and I. So that's why this matters to you this morning that any, anything that has to do with society begins with you. You're part of us. We're part of each other. Secondly, <clears throat> that person, sooner or later, if there's going to be a collection of people, there'll be a marriage. And two people will form a union. And in some families, there'll be children that result from that. And then that collection of families for good reasons, we'll want to gather together and they'll form a village. And things go and the village gets bigger and they need more uh, laws and they need more technology and so forth and it'll form a city. And on it goes. And then eventually those cities will find some reason to work together and they'll form a state or a province. And eventually they'll form a nation. And the fabric of the nation begins with the person, just in that way. And it follows into the family. So we want to think about person this morning, family this morning. But each one of us are part of this fabric that's being woven. And God has a plan for the fabric of society. And we want to talk about it, ask you to think about it. All right. I'm going to first draw your attention to a particular kind of fabric, In Revelation chapter 15, if you're able to stand, you can read with me. We're going to talk about weavers this morning and ask ourselves, are we the kind of weaver that God has desired? Because we're all part, we're all weaving something. Revelation 15 in the sixth verse. And the seven angels came out of the temple having seven plagues. But they were clothed in a special kind of garment, and it was pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. Later on in the Revelation, you might see another image of um, people on horseback, and they're clothed in white linen. And the Bible has a lot to say about linen. It's a particular type of garment. 
with a particular kind of weed, and I'm going to use it as an illustration. Exodus chapter 26, just um, three verses about a particular kind of garment and a particular type of weed, and what that might help us understand. Exodus 26 and verse 31. This is regarding the garment that God said that the high priest was to wear. And thou shalt make a... Beg your pardon, I'll get there in a minute. This is, um, this is going to be about the curtain that separated the holiest place from the holy place, all right, in the tabernacle. Verse 31, And thou shalt make it a veil of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen of cunning work. With cherubim shall it be made. God did not direct anything haphazardly. In the tabernacle, everything was done according to his direction. Um, there was only one of them at any one time among the people. And this veil separated the place where the Ark of the Covenant was from the um, holy place where the priests did their weekly work. And he said it had this particular color of blue and purple and scarlet, but it was made of linen. Leviticus chapter 16. And this is the last of these three verses. <clears throat> so it wasn't just the curtain, it was also what the high priest wore in the 16th chapter and verse 4 of Leviticus. He said, he shall put on a holy linen coat. He shall have linen breeches upon his flesh. He'll be girded with a linen girdle. And with a linen miter shall he be attired. These are the holy garments. Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water and so put them on. So prior to the Day of Atonement, or on the, ta beg your pardon, on the Day of Atonement, when he um, went into the tabernacle in the holiest of holies, he was to put on this linen garment, these linen clothes. It was, it was kind of a, an attire that he wore this once a year to go into the presence of God in a place that no one could go except that one time each year. Father, as we continue, we pray that you would guide and direct us. Help us not to um, <clears throat> wander in our minds this morning, but help us try and to stay dedicated to what we're doing. Lord, most of all, we pray your spirit would speak to each heart, and if there's a need here, that before we go, we might make a move to get our need met. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Okay. I'm glad you're here. I always like to say it's no fun talking to empty benches. And you came because you wanted to worship God. You didn't want to hear from uh, some man. You wanted to hear something that was going to help you make heaven your home. That's why you're here. So we'll do our best to see if we can make that happen. We're talking about a weave, a tight weave. And as I thought about this, different articles and garments that are woven in different ways. And I read a little bit about it, and we have some among us that are textile experts, and they're weavers, and they have looms, and they make things like this, and they know, more, they know about, about the different <coughs> nomenclature on the machinery and the type of weaving and so forth. And so I know a little bit, but not anywhere like that. I do, I think, know what an afghan is. I'm led to believe, and you correct me if I'm wrong, what, what I have understood an afghan to be, and I'm talking about a, a blanket, is, is something with a very loose weave. Am I right? Is that right? It's, it's, it's put together a certain way. But it, it's a very loose weave. And it, it's um, woven generally with thicker threads and yarns, and, and it's warm. And on a cold winter night, you can use an afghan to stay warm, right? But I imagine if one person took one side of it and another person took another side of it and they pulled, 
it wouldn't be too hard to pull it apart. Okay? Garments like that, or articles of personal clothing or things like that, rugs and blankets and so forth. <clears throat> Loose weaves, they tend, to, they, they tend to come apart, right? You might have a sock, and after a while, the sock starts to unravel at the top. You get a thread, or maybe in this coat or a sleeve or something, and there's all of these garments that we're wearing, they're all woven. Generally, Now, some of them are knitted by hand, but others are, are woven with a particular piece of machinery, most of them. And um, it's amazing to me, as I was th thinking, I was looking around this morning and looking what we're all wearing. Now, unless you're wearing something that's made of a, an animal skin, like leather, or something like that, it's, it's, if it's flax, or if it's cotton, or some... Um, you know, <clears throat> artificial fabric, um, well then it's woven, generally. And it's amazing how technology has advanced this way, and we know that the tighter the weave, generally the longer that will last. This thing here is woven. And I looked up, flax is a particular type of plant which is grown in certain parts of the world. <clears throat> And linen is made from flax, the stalks of a flax, and the particular parts of those stalks, they take them apart and um, take those, that material from the flax plant. Flax seed is used for other purposes. And then it's, there's a whole process in modern manufacture to make linen uh, that I won't go through here because it's quite lengthy in the steps that they take to make it, washing and bleaching or uh, uh, applying different heat or uh, combination and all this stuff involving machinery. And at the end of it, <clears throat> before they put it on a, and would it be a spindle? What, what's, what's the, Emily, where are you? Emily. Say hello, there's a lot of people here, I can't see you. What's, what, what's the little spindle thing that the spool? Or bobbin, bobbin is a better word. And so these, these threads that come off of the flax, they're wound onto these bobbins and there can be hundreds of, of them on a machine. And, and these little threads and these bobbins are wound on this bobbin, right? And then, and then from the bobbin, they're <coughs> separated again and they're moved through this process, and you can tell I, I barely know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> but I saw pictures of it, and, and it sort of makes sense to me. And, <clears throat> and these threads, they're so tiny, they come from this plant, which is amazing, and are separated and, and placed in certain ways so that crossways and, you know, doesn't come apart. And at the end of it, it, it makes linen. Linen is a particular type of cloth, right? Very tightly woven. If we were to take a microscope, and, and I'm not sure if I would call this linen or not, maybe we would, uh, because I have no idea what uh, this would be called. But I can see the back of it, and I can actually see the little threads and the weave in it. And if we were to take a microscope and look even further, we would find the, the tightly woven fabric. Now, I suppose if one is really strong, you could take this and just pull and you could rip it, right? But it would take a lot of force to do that. It's a pretty tight weave. It's not a loose weave. And it's meant to last a long time because it's a tight weave, right? And linen is that way. Linen is, your tablecloths at home, if you have a linen tablecloth, it's a very tight weave. Many linen tablecloths, they last generations because they're, they're woven so well. So we want to talk about <clears throat> tightly woven garments and tightly woven fabrics this morning. Obviously a weave is made of fabric and it's, a fabric is made of threads. In our spiritual application here, we're going to look at the weave of a, of a life and what threads are woven into that life to make it a tightly woven life, a life that will stand the test of time 
and all the trials that come against it? And what are the materials and the beliefs that form the threads of a tightly woven life? There are certain patterns that are essential for a tight weave. You can't just put it together any old way, right? Otherwise, it won't stick together. It won't stay together. It's not put together right. And then finally, I want to talk about a master weaver who is also a good shepherd. And at the end of all this, I want to ask us again, where have all the weavers gone? Because we are meant to be weavers. We are meant to take threads and help people weave a tightly woven life that will stand the test of time and the trials that come against it. We are meant to be good weavers. Not just some among us, but all of us. And all of us can ask ourselves when we leave here, am I weaving a tightly woven life? <clears throat> I want to turn to John chapter 10. We read these verses on linen. And God uses linen as a type of a tightly woven life. A life with value. John chapter 10 and verse 11. And there is one who's the master weaver. I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd giveth his life for his sheep. Weaving a life requires a shepherd. It requires a weaver. <clears throat> the shepherd is a weaver. You have a flock, <clears throat> but without a shepherd, <clears throat> that flock will <clears throat> come unraveled. We need a shepherd to stay tightly woven. <clears throat> you might know somebody and their life is kind of unraveled, you can be a shepherd. You can be a weaver. But it's going to require certain changes in us. You just don't show up at a linen factory and know how to work the equipment. You don't start in the field as a farmer <clears throat> or a grower of flax and just throw some seeds out and everything works out. It takes, it takes something training, it takes some changes, knowledge, experience. So all of us, if we want to be a weaver, a shepherd, something has to happen to us first, okay? But I want to remember Jesus, he is the master weaver, and he is the good shepherd. I love this verse, it says, <clears throat> I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. I just stopped for a minute when I read that. He gives his life force. Jesus gave his life force for us. There's been, or another word is vital force, this life. Our vitality. We are meant to spend our vitality for a purpose. We're not just here to come to church, listen to a few words, go on, and whatever we do the rest of the week, it's all good. We're meant to give of our life force, our vital force, for somebody else. Amen. Amen. Don't look at me puzzled, please. <clears throat> we are meant to give of ourselves for somebody else. Because otherwise, if God can't work through us, God has to work through somebody. If he can't work through us, the fabric of our nation will unravel because nobody else is going to do it. Popular philosophy, popular opinion, uh, uh, what, what professes to be um, um, knowledgeable in the society today, it leaves God out of the weave. And when you leave God out of the weave of your life, you will tend to unravel. <clears throat> and by the way, that's not just for the society, that's for us. If we're sitting here this morning and we're adding certain threads to our life that God can't use, we will begin to unravel. 
if we're doing things, if we're saying things, if we're going places, if we're taking, if we're taking the threads of those things into our life and we're weaving those things into our life, our life will begin to unravel. Where have all the weavers gone? Life is a weave. The Bible is using this image of fine linen, which is a tight weave, it's a strong weave. Linen symbolizes holiness and righteousness. We read in the Torah when God gave Moses that instruction on how to build the tabernacle and then what the priest was supposed to wear. It was that garment and not another, right? And when we see it again in the Revelation, and now he's talking about his army, and he's talking about these angelic figures, and they're, we they're wearing the same garment that he told Moses that Aaron should wear. There's a reason for this. This is not by accident that God's drawing our attention to fine linen. It's the righteousness of our life. We're meant to weave with stuff that creates righteousness in us. That's the purpose of the weave, a tight weave. I want to lead, uh, I would like to uh, read just a bit more in that Leviticus chapter again in 16. I'm going to ask you, how's, how's the weave of your life? Is it tight or is it unraveling? <clears throat> is your life kind of an afghan that you can see through? Or is our life kind of a tightly woven weave that is meant to be like that? <clears throat> Verse chapter 16 again, okay? The Lord spake to Moses after the death of two sons of Aaron, and they offered before the Lord and died. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to Aaron thy brother that he come not at all times into the holy place, within the veil, before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, so he doesn't die. Because I'm going to appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat once a year, to him anyway. Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place, with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. And, and he'll put on, we read this, he's going to put on this holy linen coat. He was supposed to go through a certain ritual from the time that he entered the court of the tabernacle and he was without and he offered the burnt offering and, and he was to wash himself, he was to take off the garments that he came there with. And then these garments were there, and he was to put these on. In other words, he was to put on something that he wasn't wearing when he got there. He wasn't allowed to continue in God's service until he put on these garments. And he had to be clean. Everything about him had to be clean, had to be washed, had to go certain, through certain steps in the ritual when he worked into the holy place. <clears throat> and then finally, as he lit the uh, incense on the altar of incense, and it filled the rooms of the tabernacle, <clears throat> and he had the blood of the sacrifice, and there was a certain steps he had to go through before he got into the holiest of holies, or he would have died. We need to change. From a moment where we come to this tabernacle of life, to the point where we stand in the presence of God, we need to change. And it's not just after we die. We need to change now. We need to put on something now so that we can stand before God and be accepted by God. He uses this white linen garment and of different colors. This linen garment, this tightly woven weave as a symbol of righteousness that allows us to stand before God. My first question is, have we all been changed? And we're going to get to that in a minute. Because there are certain things that have to happen in order to have a tightly woven weave. This tightly woven weave <clears throat> is meant to be extraordinary. It's not an ordinary weave. It's not daily clothing. I have um, clothing that I use when I, go, when, I, when I work, when I 
when I build things or when I under the car or when I get grubby, <clears throat> I, I think of it as my grubby clothing. And I'm allowed to keep it for so long and then my wife will remove it and it won't be there anymore. And it's grubby. <clears throat> and I'm not, and, and I agree with this. So after the service, don't you say that, you know, I'm put on. But, you know, we, we, we wear this around the project, but we're not meant to go to dinner looking like this, right? Right? We're not meant to go, we're not, we're not meant to go out in public, right? Looking in our grubbies. All, I mean, you can, go, you can go to Home Depot like this, but you're not meant to go out and go dinner, right? And the wife said, amen, amen, brother, preach your brother. I can't get anything. And so, <clears throat> call it our grubby. But you also have clothing that's nice clothing, and you try and keep it nice so that it doesn't get grubby, right? It doesn't get stained and spotted, right? And you use that for those occasions where that's where you want to you wanna look like, right? So you come to church, you don't, I mean, you can't always help it, but if you could help it, you really don't want to come to church looking like you just came out from under a car and the oil spilled all over you, you know, and that's how you sit down and you feel good about that. Sometimes you can't help it, and so come to church anyway. But we like to honor God, right? So we, we, we do the best we can. And it's the same here. He's talking about a garment that he wants us to wear. That's not just ordinary, it's extraordinary. And somebody says, well, brother, that's what I put on when I go to church on Sunday. No, 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 no. This garment we're supposed to wear every day of the week, all the time. When we're alone in the morning or late at night, we need to have this garment on. When we're out in on vacation and we don't know anybody and we're in some place and the folks that we know are not there, we're meant to have this garment on. The garment of righteousness. It's not a take it on, take it off thing. We're supposed to have it on. Amen. A special garment, extraordinary garment, tightly woven, something that God can look at and say, I approve of that. We're not meant to wear our grubbies in life. Not, not when we're talking about our spiritual garments. We can wear our grubbies to work, we can wear our grubbies to Home Depot, but this garment is supposed to be extraordinary. And guess what? It's not supposed to be spotted. It's not supposed to be stained. And so spots and stains, those are things in a life which damage this fine linen garment. Spots and stains are sin. We're not meant to wear this holy garment out into our daily existence and expose it to sinful things. Come on now. We, we can wear our grubbies for our daily work but this garment is not supposed to be stained and spotted. Is that Ephesians chapter 5? Come on. If you get there, tell me. Verse 27. <clears throat> talking about a life that's sanctified by the washing of the word that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. We're supposed to be like that all the time. Somebody says, oh, brother, no, that's, that's for special people. No, this is for ordinary people to make them extraordinary. Because we can't do this by ourselves. Life is a weave. They use the special materials. Psalms chapter 1. And I'm, I'm, I'm asking this morning, how's your weave? How's your weave at the beginning of the year? Is it loose? Is it coming apart? Is it unraveling? Because God can reweave us, but he's going to use special material. 
The ungodly are not so, but they're like the chaff, verse 4, which the wind drives away. And a threshing floor, <clears throat> the Bible tells us when somebody would bring uh, cu uh, cut wheat from the field, they have to separate the chaff from the wheat. That wheat kernel is what we're going to make flour out of, but everything else, we're not going to use it to eat it. So we need to separate the chaff from the wheat, right? We need to separate it. It's the same thing with flax when we're making linen. The seeds from the flax, you can't use to make linen. You have to separate it. There are certain parts of the stalk for the flax that you can use and other stuff that you can't. Stuff needs to be separated. Now, a person needs to be willing to let the chaff be separated from the wheat of their life. And not everybody's ready yet at the same time, and not everybody's ready right now. Some people might take time to get ready, but we need to be willing to let God separate. We need to be willing to let God thrash us. And he's not unkind. It's a, it's a necessary thrashing. And he'll separate the wheat of our life from the chaff. The wheat we get to keep, the chaff we need to let go. He'll eventually make fine linen if we'll let God do it. All right? The chaff is worthless. The wheat is valuable. Pride is chaff. Stubbornness is chaff. Personal opinion is chaff. Upset at God, that's chaff. Arrogance is chaff. Material goods are chaff. And I wrote down, I'm glad for clothes, I'm glad for a house, I'm glad for food, but don't worship it. If you worship that stuff, it becomes chaff. We can convert blessings into cursings if we start to worship anything but God. What's wheat? Wheat is humility. Wheat is mercy. Wheat is compassion. Wheat is, is kindness. Wheat is love for God. Chaff and wheat. Some of it he can use for the threads of his weave and some of it he can't. And we cannot presume that we have a linen garment if we're using things that God can't use in his weave. Amen. Now listen. Let's go to Matthew chapter 3. We said there are certain things that God uses for his weave. <clears throat> and I was looking at John the Baptist and he's weaving. John the Baptist here is weaving and preaching in the wilderness and he says, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The first thing he says is repent. God uses the loom of repentance to weave. It begins with repentance and it continues with repentance. We can't presume that one day I went to the altar and I repented. And ever since then, I have a very tightly wound weave. Repentance is necessary at any time in our life that we recognize that there's something in there that God can't use, a thread that we've incorporated. And he said, <clears throat> for this is what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying the, the voice of one crieth, in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. The same John had his raiment of camel's hair, a leathern girdle about his loins. His meat was locusts and wild honey. They went out to him, Jerusalem and all Judea and the region round about Jordan. They were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said to them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? You are weaving with the wrong thread. And your garments are too loosely woven. Bring therefore fr fruit forth, therefore fruits meet for repentance. The first step in a life which is tightly woven is repentance. And today, people think that's an old-fashioned idea. 
Repentance means change your mind. We cannot presume that we're wearing the garment God has made for us if we're not willing to change our mind first. We don't just walk up to God one day and say, well, I've got my certificate. I'm ready for my linen garment. Doesn't work like that, does it? Amen. And I wonder sometimes if we really understand what kind of repentance is necessary for a, a finely woven linen garment, right? We say that we understand, but repentance is going to require getting rid of the chaff. Repentance requires being thrashed. Amen. There are some that presume to have a fine linen garment, but they're not willing to repent. Acts chapter 13. And I'll just refer to it. <clears throat> we were in here the other day. This false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was also known as Elymas, he was preaching, <clears throat> and he wanted to be full of the Holy Ghost. But he didn't have a fine linen garment on. If you saw his spiritual cloak, it was, it was spotted, it was stained, it wasn't right. And the Lord revealed it to, um, to Paul. <clears throat> and Paul said in verse 11, Now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And there fell on him a mist and darkness, and he, he needed somebody to lead him. Why? Because he was trying to do this without going through the steps that God required. Remember back in the tabernacle, God told Moses, I want you to do certain things. And he told the high priest, you've got to do it a certain way. And it's not just legalism. If we make presumptions upon God that I'm good, I believe in God. He didn't ask you whether you believed in God. He's asking, have you repented? Have you changed your mind since you've been born? Have you recognized that th th the spiritual garment that you wear is spotted and stained by our own foolishness. We don't have to defend this. You don't have to come up to me after church and say, Pastor, I want to let you know that I've, I've been changed and I, I want you to understand that um, no man will tell me you know, whether I'm right or wrong. And all this kind of self-defensive stuff, you don't have to do that. I'm not your judge. You don't have to defend yourself to me. What we need to do is ask ourselves, have I repented? Have I changed my mind? Have I recognized that I came to this wearing the garment of my own foolishness and I ask God, take it off and give me a garment of righteousness that's tightly woven? God uses certain things. He uses repentance in this weave. It's essential. People that don't use it, They've got a loose weave, it's going to unravel, it's not going to work. So the master weaver is Christ. He gives us the materials. He, he weaves the linen. He uses the... And our beliefs, right, have to line up with his beliefs. And he uses that to weave this garment that we can wear of righteousness. God creates this garment, the process that he goes through, he, the, the tremendous things that God did to be in a position to weave this garment for us. Today out here in our world today, <clears throat> there's a tremendous lack of weavers that know how to weave this kind of garment. And I'm not suggesting that we can save anybody, but we need to have the knowledge of those things that God uses in his weave. Tremendous lack of weavers. The peer pressure of the world at school and at work, <clears throat> it wants to quiet people. 
Don't you dare open your mouth because you'll be misunderstood. People make fun of you. They'll misunderstand your, they'll, they'll think that you're just a religious person like everybody else. So don't open your mouth. Just let your light shine. Let your life reveal. And don't say anything. Sometimes that's okay, but many times that loom is quiet. A loom in the olden days, and perhaps even today, in a factory that's weaving linen or a, or a cloth, it's a noisy place. <laughs> weaving cloth is a noisy thing if there's a lot of it being made. Open your mouth. God, help us open our mouth. Help us make a little bit of noise. This, this, this is part of the process of weaving. And the Lord brought to my attention this morning, God help us not to complain and find fault in 2024. Lord help us not to complain and find fault. And then stab, backstab or carry tales or gossip. That, 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 that unravels a tightly woven weave. It's not used, it's not part of the process of weaving righteousness. Help us not look at each other and start to unravel somebody else. God hates that. Now we might have some ideas about things that we'd like to see different and all of that is good and we do that. But that's quite different than finding fault. God doesn't use that thread when he weaves. Fault finding. No, he doesn't. Amen. How are we weaving? Without God, people start to unravel. Lives unravel. And the last one is I want you to look at a good weaver. <clears throat> He's an example in Acts chapter 8. And I'm just going to go to a couple verses. And after verse 26, the angel of the Lord spake to Philip. And Philip was an apostle. Philip, by the way, was just like you. So when I'm reading about Philip, he can be you, okay? No different, but he's repented. And he's interested in hungering and thirsting after righteousness. And he loves this linen garment that he's wearing, this spiritual garment. And the angel of the Lord spake to Philip and he said, Arise, go to the south by the way that goes down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and he went, and behold, there was a man of Ethiopia, a, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasure. She had come to Jerusalem to worship, and she was returning. I beg your pardon, he was returning. And sitting on the chariot, this man was reading Isaiah the prophet. But you know what? What he was reading was not tightly woven. It was a loose weave. He didn't get it. It wasn't doing anything for him. That's what loose weaves do that need to be tight. They're really not doing anything for us. I referenced an Afghan, and I hope I got it right, and somebody will tell me later if I didn't, but you know a, 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 a blanket that's loosely woven, right? And, and if you were to go out in public wearing that and nothing else, you'd probably be embarrassed not going to be working for you, right? And, and it's just not appropriate, right? <clears throat> well, some people are wearing spiritual afghans and thinking that they're covered. And the weave is sufficient. It's not. And thank God one day that he revealed to us that we did not have the garment that he wanted us to have. So Philip, he's speaking to this man, and the guy's reading the Bible, but he doesn't get it. And Philip ran to him and said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I accept somebody guide me? I need a master weaver that can help weave the thread of the story so that I get it. And he desired Philip would come up and sit with him. See, we just need to ask people, do you, are, do you understand? 
Is there something going on? Can I help with? Seem like you're confused about this, or what is it that you're trying to figure out? I wonder if I can sit with you and we can work on this together. Maybe I can help weave part of the story for you here. I'm interested in weaving. And, and, the, and the place of the scripture where he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, like the lamb dumb before the shearer. So opened he not his mouth, and in his humiliation his judgment was taken away. Who shall declare his generation, for his life was taken from the earth? And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, what's he talking about? And Philip opened his mouth, and he began to weave, he began to weave. He took out his spiritual loom, he took out the threads that he knew that, that he had, and he, be, and, he, and, he, and he connected those threads from those bobbins to this place on the loom, and he began to weave a story. He began to help him interpret life. That's what weaving, that's what this weave is. It's an interpretation of life. And, and they went their way and they came to certain water and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, thou mayest. And he answered and he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he didn't just say it with his mouth. He had already repented in his heart. He had determined, I'm going to change. I want to be, I want this weave. I've woven a life that is too loose. It's spotted. I want this tight weave. And in that moment, God gave him a different garment. And he was able to take that to his baptism because he was changed. <clears throat> I, I have a great concern for people's lives who are unraveling. It's, it's a hard thing to watch somebody whose life is unraveling. There were times in all of our lives, at one time or another, we can all relate at a time when our life was beginning to unravel. And if we're ever so fortunate, some of us can relate to a moment when a weaver found us and used the thread that God uses to, to, to help us understand a tightly woven weave. And then we can begin to ask the master weaver, the good shepherd who gave his life, may, may I have, may I, may I participate in this linen garment that you only give to those who desire righteousness. Because the linen garment doesn't represent our righteousness, it represents his righteousness. But we, we come across people today who are suffering so greatly. And I, I do believe that sometimes a person begins to use a thread in, in the weave of that life which God cannot use and become so frustrated wanting to, wanting to use that garment, wanting to be seen in that garment, right? But it's got threads in it that God can't use and it's really not woven by God. We're weaving it. All right. Beliefs. <clears throat> Threads, materials that God can use. A tightly woven weave that represents a life which is connected to God, that wants holiness, that wants to live in a righteous way. A tightly woven weave. A life that God accepts inside this holiest place, right? That's repented of Spots and stains. How is it this morning? We're looking into 2024. We want to launch into this year. How's the weave of our life? 
if we find threads that we're trying to weave with or threads that we're giving God or however you want to say this analogy and God can't use that thread, well, then we need to repent of that. Uh, I see that I've been trying to weave my own existence using my pride and, and all, the, all the anxiety and fear. And, you know, God doesn't use fear and anxiety to weave with. He replaces that with his love. And that is a t- fear and anxiety creates a very loose weave. God doesn't use harmful substances that we might at a time have used. He doesn't use those. Say, well, brother, God forgives me and he knows my heart. God doesn't use that to create this garment. So we need to repent of that idea, be willing to change from that idea, so we only let him use those things that he can use. If I say it right. All right. Let's stand. Thank you for your help this morning. Where have all the weavers gone? God's still looking for laborers in the field who also are weavers of this holy way, presenting this holy way. And the master weaver is Jesus.